Welcome back, everyone. We will continue to start with our program to not lose any time because we will have some very great speakers the rest of the day as well, with hopefully some time left for questions. So that's why I want to um, go and continue um, and give the floor to our speakers. And first off is going to be the speaker, Thijs Bendixson. He unfortunately was not able to be here in person, but he has pre-recorded his uh, contribution and we will share it uh, with you. Um, Thijs Bendixson is a psychologist, author and PhD fellow at Aarhus University in Denmark. And he has written two popular science books on the importance of science and scientific thinking. The latest of which also includes critical discussions of alternative therapies, including cannabis-based remedies. And recently he contributed um, the foreword to Christopher Smith's book, um, den wichtigen Buch, den Norgens sind der Haarlast um Cannabis. Sorry about my pronunciation. <laughs> so without further ado, I will give um, the technicians the time to get the video on. And we won't, and for, since he's not here, he will not be able to accept any questions. But if there are questions, you can always send them in on, uh, via email and we will forward it to him. So thank you. Instead, my talk is more of an awareness raiser. Namely, I want to argue that in all facets of the cannabis debate, um, or rather debates, because I think there are many intertwined debates going on, uh, but in all these debates, uh, we should at all times remain emotionally detached. And what do I mean about that? Well. I mean that we should apply reason, consider evidence, consider facts. In short, we should think science when we think about cannabis. I also want to illustrate um, in this talk what can happen if we don't think scientifically about cannabis and also why thinking scientifically about cannabis can sometimes be, be difficult uh, in these matters. So that was a very brief recap of the talk, um, but I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So let's start from the beginning. I um, I want to start off with a um, a short story uh, that kind of frames uh, the talk, the discussion that I want to, and the messages that I want to bring across. So I want to tell you a story and, and would like to keep um, or have you keep that story in your frontal lobes for the next 10 to 15 minutes during the talk and then I'll promise to return back to cannabis and the public debates um, in due time. But yeah, so I want to tell you about Franz Anton Mesmer. Mesmer was an 18th century Austrian physician who became famous across Europe uh, for his medical use of magnets. Mesmer enjoyed his heyday in Paris, France, where he uh, served particularly the royal and the rich. So just to give you a sense of how Mesmer worked, here's Carl Sagan, the great American astronomer and popularizer of science, and his colorfully um, portraying Mesmer and his methods. So. Mesmer had thought that the positions of the planets influenced human health, and he was caught up in the wonderism of 
electricity and magnetism. He catered to the declining French nobility on the eve of the revolution. They crowded into a darkened room and dressed in a gold flowered silk robe and waving an ivory wand, Mesmer seated his marks around a vat of dilute sulfuric acid. The magnetizer and his young male assistants peered deeply into the eyes of their patients and rubbed their bodies. They grasped iron bars protruding into the solution or held each other's hands. In contagious frenzy, aristocrats, especially young women, were cured left and right. Mesmer became a sensation. So, in short, what Carl Sagan is trying to say here is that Mesmer was a charlatan. Um, this is not to say that that Mesmer did not believe in magnetism himself. I have no reason to claim uh, otherwise. Uh, the, the point is that Mesmer was hyper-focused and not very open to critical dialogue. For instance, when um, Mesmer was confronted with criticism, such as a treatment that didn't go as planned, his usual prescription was that patients were too skeptical uh, and they, that they just needed to believe some more. Charles McKay, a Scottish journalist of the 19th century, characterized Mesmer as a man who, quote, did not allow facts to interfere with his theories. So Mesmer was a sensation, but not everyone was swept up by Mesmer's magnetism. The French doctoral stand expressed their antagonism for one. And in 1784, the French king at that time appointed a commission to investigate the claims made by Mesmer. This commission was led by none else than the American inventor, Benjamin Franklin. And it also included uh, several other of that time's finest scientists. The commission became known as the Franklin Commission. The Franklin Commission knew as much that an individual's experience of illness could wax and wane from hour to hour and day to day, and that psychological conditions influence the severity of many illnesses. Today we call it the placebo effect, the, the power of the mind over the, the experience of illness. So the Franklin Commission saw the need for an experiment. They had objects instilled with magnetism by some of Mesmer's assistants. And then they confronted people who had previously experienced great effect from Mesmer's treatments with these objects, and also for objects that were not magnetized. Crucially, of course, the participants did not know which objects were which, whether they had been magnetized or not. This experiment is usually considered one of the first placebo-controlled clinical trials in history. So what did the commission find? Indeed, participants reacted very strongly to the magnetized objects. But, and here's a revealing detail, only when they were told that the objects were quote-unquote magnetized. If not, no reaction. And if the participants were presented with non-magnetized objects, but were told that the objects actually were magnetized, a reaction would tend to transpire. So the conclusion, the commission really had no other conclusion that it must be all in the mind of the participants. Of course, Mesmer was not happy about this conclusion and he complained about the experimental designs and, and other things. But it really didn't matter too much. Uh, Mesmer's reputation had taken damage beyond repair. And before long, he was forced to retire until his death in 1850. So the case that I want to make with this story is the following. Science is important because it works. Science is not something that we have inherited from scripture or something that we do just because this is how we've always done things. No, 
rather science is a continuous work in progress where methods and findings are constantly being updated, negotiated, refined. And I think the Franklin Commission very beautifully illustrates the power and principles of science. I think the commission was probably against Mesmer personally, um, but that's not really the, the point. Had magnetism actually worked as claimed, the experiment would have shown just that, only that it didn't. Of course, many books have been written about the principles of modern science. People differ on the exact nature of these. Um, those interested and those who can read Danish, I've written a couple of books uh, on the matter myself. Otherwise, I would recommend Carl Sagan's um, excellent writing on this and all other matters, really. Okay, back to cannabis before we tie it all together. Where do I see that we could use some more science in the cannabis matters? And, and where do I see uh, cases of bad and um, unscientific thinking? So I want to highlight a, a set of, of cases um, of their rather examples of, of bad thinking in this domain. First, um, offers confusing medical with recre recreational cannabis. And what do I mean about that? So um, I think we're often conflating the debates on medical cannabis with legalizing recreational cannabis. But to me, um, you could actually on justifiable grounds be strongly opposed to cannabis in one of these debates, but being somewhat more hesitant in, in the other debate, suggesting that these are indeed orthogonal. But the debates are often conflated nonetheless, um, such as when the medical potential of some cannabis products motivates someone to argue for legalizing recreational cannabis. Um, or when people question the hazards of recreational cannabis and then conclude that medical cannabis at least is also sure to be at least as harmful um, uh, oh, sorry, at least harmful uh, and, and if not beneficial to the health. So in what remains of this talk, I mostly have medical cannabis in mind. Another common fallacy or pitfall in this domain, I think, is what I call appealing to ancient wisdom. So this is a fallacy whereby someone w would argue for legalizing cannabis either medically or recreationally, by appealing to bygone errors and societies that use cannabis for a variety of purposes. It is indeed the case that cannabis is, and were historically in many aspects uh, of daily life, uh, used for cooking, clothes and rope making, um, for religious rituals and so on. Um, this is a particular fallacy that I uh, highlight on in my contribution to the white guide for this summit. Uh, and in that contribution, I write, we cannot simply appeal to ancient wisdom when furnishing a modern society. Throughout history, humans have engaged in the most horrendous of traditions, human sacrifice, slavery, cannibalism, to mention but a few, that a cultural practice or tradition was historically pre prevalent does not in itself make it worth preserving. Another common fallacy is what is sometimes known as natural fallacy. This is a fallacy whereby people appeal to the naturalness of cannabis to argue for particularly its medical use. Because cannabis is considered a more natural um, drug than other medicines, it's ever also thought or assumed uh, to be safer and more effective. But of course, many popular Medicines are um, derived from plants, mushrooms, and other um, natural sources, or at least originally they were isolated from such uh, sources. But even if this was not the case, um, it's not really a principal reason why natural drugs should be safer and more effective than modernly assigned drugs designed specifically for some ailment. Natural 
does not mean good, uh, not in this specific case, in terms of cannabis, and not in general. Uh, so just to give you a couple of examples of this, many natural things are quite bad. Um, I think you will agree, storms, earthquakes, viruses, um, and many quote unquote unnatural things are quite good, such as nutritional foods, uh, clean drinking water, sanitary conditions, hygiene, and stuff like that. So that's also a common fallacy. The final fa fallacy that I want to highlight here is what I call wishful thinking. Wishful thinking is when we really want something to be true. Um, and then we also often convince ourselves that this is indeed the case, um, often in the absence of evidence. But of course, when we really want something to be true, um, or medical drug to be effective, for instance, that's exactly when we should be extra careful, because that is when we are easiest to be misled uh, by others or ourselves. So, I think these are fallacies that I think are quite common. I hope you can recognize them, um, at least one of them or a few of them in your own, um, in your own work. Um, and I want to just illustrate what I think go wrong when we, um, when we don't think scientifically. Um, and I want to focus on the Danish case. So in Denmark, I think all of these biases and probably also some political opportunism combined to produce a four-year trial period for cannibal, uh, med medical uh, cannabis against a subset of conditions. Um, again, I think there was some political opportunism as well. Uh, there were calls in the public to allow medical cannabis against this or that uh, condition. But to be clear, I think this was a very bad call. By making it into law, cannabis gained a more honorable uh, reputation than warranted, and all the while Danish doctors and medical researchers all over the country were screaming that this was a risky move and that um, not enough evidence exists to probably both implement and also evaluate such an experiment. So it was a bad call in my opinion, and it really turned the political process on its head. Uh, right? You had the the public call and then the politicians that rushed in to uh, to set this in motion um, but obviously this is a very drastic decision and um, it really is just a, a grand public experiment that went against many of the experts and many of the doctors and medical researchers um, advice so that's the Danish case So, all of this is to say that, as I see it, uh, politicians and the public, really, were swept up by the promise of cannabis, much like the French aristocrats were swept up by the promise of mesmer's magnetism. It didn't go well then, and I don't think it will go well now. Instead, we should collectively, and this is really my most important appeal to this summit. Um, we should collectively take the stance of the Franklin Commission and actually interrogate the matter. We should weigh risks and benefits objectively and systematically. We should isolate pros and cons, weed out myths and misconceptions. That is to say, the cannabis debate should be based on rationality, reason, evidence, science. I hope and believe this is an appeal that will be well recognized and also perhaps acted upon during this summit and and beyond, hopefully. Okay, it's time to round, to round off. Um, my deepest thanks for your time and your patience. I hope this was helpful one way or the other. Um, I wish you all a very pleasant and constructive if not a mesmerizing summit. Stay well and thanks again.